So in the last class, uh, we learned about the uh, deep learning, okay? So we uh, briefly review how deep learning becomes popular, right? And this is the difference between the pipeline of shallow learning and deep learning architecture. And this is the reason for why deep learning performs better than a shallow learning approach, okay? So, it can uh, learn the intermediate representation in the optimal way via the end-to-end -end training, right? And also it can, the deep learning can represent the non-linearity, okay? And, and also I mentioned that uh, deep learning are uh, to be the intermediate layers of the deep learning architecture each individual layer should be differentiable, right? Respect to their input and also respect to their parameters, okay? Then uh, when we compose the entire network using the uh, differentiable layers, then the entire network becomes differentiable, right? And then we can uh, learn their parameters using this uh, gradient. This, this rule is actually, their name is gradient descent, okay? So we can learn parameters uh, using this formula, okay? When the networks are differentiable, okay? And also we learn how to calculate a gradient in uh, deep architectures, okay? So we can step-by-step uh, step for each layers from right to left, for each step we can calculate gradient and by the chain rule we can multiply them all, then we can get the parameters for uh, the differentiation of the, uh, the differentiation of the final output respect to the uh, initial input, okay? And so this is the general deep learning architecture, but uh, before CNN, uh, there have been several uh, deep learning architectures, but uh, this CNN was the first that recorded as the state-of-the-art algorithm in image classification task, ImageNet, which is the uh, largest scale ImageNet uh, image classification benchmark, right? After that, uh, people are uh, focusing on this CNN architecture when they uh, say about the deep learning, okay? And there, uh, it's, the CNN is the abbreviation for convolutional neural network. And they are called as CNN because uh, they have convolutions as the main uh, block, okay? And this convolution was uh, some, uh, the researchers uh, who may uh, first invent this CNN may be in, uh, inspired by the fact that uh, this convolution is differentiable operation, and at the same time, they are uh, frequently used in image processing task. Okay, and they are conducting. They are want, wanting to process these images as input, and want to map it to some uh, class probability. Right. So in that sense, they are maybe inspired. Are inspired to use the convolution operation as the main block, okay? And this is actually, uh, any differentiable layers could be here, but uh, they selected convolution operation. And actually this is the uh, figure for the CNN architecture, okay? So these, uh, these things are, uh, representing the convolution layers, right? And also there are another layers whose name is pooling layer in the CNN architecture. And also there are another layers uh, called as fully connected layers. And eventually they map it to some one dimensional vector that represents the uh, class probability, right? In image classification task, the task is to uh, categorize uh, each image into some of the class, right? 
So at the end of the architecture, we uh, obtain C dimensional vector when C denotes the number of classes. Okay. And we uh, apply some argmax for this uh, probability vector and choose the uh, maximum dimension as the, uh, the class index, right? Okay. If the probability is high, for example, we have a uh, five dimension vector in the, at the last of the CNN, it means there are five classes and let's say it had values like um, if it has values like this, then uh, this third class is the uh, class we want to uh, contact. Uh, I mean, this is the uh, predicted class for this input image, right? Because it has the highest probability. So anyway, um, in this CNN architecture, uh, they are gradually uh, reducing the first, at first, the input is two-dimensional signal, right? And when applying the convolution operation and also applying the pooling layers, they are tend to become smaller. And eventually in fully connected layer, they becomes the one-dimensional signal and actually this fully connected layer, they are uh, one dimensional operation, which is sim uh, same as uh, the regre linear uh, regressor, right? So we multiply some weight to one this signal and add some bias. This is actually happened in fully connected layers, okay? Actually they process it as the one this signal here and map it to C dimensional vector in the last layers. Okay. This is the uh, CNN architecture. Okay. So, first part, they are composed of convolution layers which can process 2D signals, and, but they tend to reduce it to 1D signal at some moment and then apply one dimensional operation after that and to map, they map. Uh, tend to map it to some one-dimensional vector, which denote the probability okay, for each class. Okay? So this is the initial CNN architecture. And from now on, I will uh, introduce you the 2D convolution operation. Maybe some of you are already familiar with this, right? So original convolution operation, uh, to process it, we need the input image, right? This is den denoting the input image. And this uh, is denoting some uh, filter corner. We need this kind of filter. So uh, in previous lecture, I mentioned that uh, convolution, applying convolution operation is roughly equivalent to applying filter, right? So uh, actually this filter is uh, you can uh, interpret that filter uh, as this filter corner, okay? So when uh, doing the convolution, we apply, actually apply this filter corner in some of the regions of the images, okay? So uh, normally filter corners are smaller than the original image. So I uh, say this image is now five by five, dimension, right? But normally this image is larger uh, in scale like this, right? So it is even uh, larger than this dimension, right? But filter corner is, we normally use filter corner to three by three to maybe 11 by 11, right? So filter corner, their dimension is uh, far smaller than the input image, okay? And then we apply this filter corner on some subspace of the image like this. And then what we do is this operation. So we multiply each element of the input image and the each element of the filter corner 
and then we all add them. Okay. So if you calculate this, this uh, result was zero. Okay. And then what you do is you shift the corner by one pixel, right? And then uh, you will get you will do the same multiplication and also the addition, and you will get this uh, output, okay? And you do this iteratively for all the image pixels, okay? So this is the 2D convolution operation, okay? So depending on the characteristics of this filter color, uh, the resultant image changes. So for example, if we want to blur the images, we can uh, set the filter corners as all one, right? Then this has the effect to average. So if you apply this filter corner here, then the resultant value here would be averaging the nearest pixels, right? So uh, in the image scale, the resultant image becomes blurry, right? Also, you can even use large uh, filters, large sized filter corner, then uh, the blurring effect uh, becomes uh, more, more uh, the, re the image becomes more blurry, right? If you use large scale, uh, filter color, right? So, and also if you use different style uh, filter color when applying the 2D convolution, then the characteristic of images become different, right? Even you can sharpening, do sharpening, right? If your color has some minus value to here and positive value to here, then uh, it has some patterns like uh, in this, pattern, right? And also uh, have some positive value here and negative value here. Then you apply this kind of colors on your image. Then uh, the image become to have some patterns in the horizontal line, right? So anyways, depending on the filter colors, the images are transformed, okay? Okay. So uh, I will say it later. And, but one thing is, uh, if you apply uh, this convolution operation on the five by five, five, five image, if you apply three by three size filter corners, then the output feature, output uh, of the, this convolution operation becomes less than the input image, right? So, the size of the output is determined by the number of possible operations you can apply to input image, right? So if you apply this, this amount of time, maybe I'm not sure you can see this. You can only apply nine times three by three corners on this image because their dimensions are like that, right? So uh, some people uh, don't like this. So sometimes you want to maintain the size of the uh, output same as the input size, right? Sometimes you may want that, right? In that case, you, what you can do is pad zero pixels around the original image. This is uh, called as zero padding because uh, we set the, I mean, we surround the zero uh, around the image, right? So actually uh, the original image was five by five, having the this dimension, but they are becoming to have seven by seven dimension now by surrounding the zero, right? When uh, this is when zero padding is one, 
but you can if you set this two, then you can pad twice for the uh this zero right around the image right. Then the dimension would become larger right. And if you apply filter corner after you do zero padding, then you can get larger scale images right like, like this right. So now you can uh, somehow re retain the original image size, okay? So, so this is the zero padding and we uh, frequently use this zero padding when doing the 2D compilation. Okay? Uh, yeah, so normally uh, when this K is filter corner size, then uh, you need uh, this amount zero padding to uh, uh, retain the original uh, image size, okay? So actually this is not depending on the, uh, I mean the original image size, but uh, depending on the filter corner size, right? So to maintain uh, this five by five, image size using when using the 555 corner size then uh, you need uh, two times zero padding right so here they do two times zero padding okay and the resultant output is in the same dimension as the original image okay and also there's another hyperparameters for the convolutions whose name is tried okay this is also very simple, okay? What it does is uh, when, uh, I mean, when we do not specify the stride, then the default value for this stride is one. And what it means is previously we shift this window by one pixels, right? So uh, how much we shift the uh, filter color, that is called as stride. Okay. Because the default stride value was one, we shift the window by one pixels, right? But if we set this stride as two, then uh, what you see is the window is now two pixels shifted, right? So because we set the stride as two, okay? And the resultant effect is we can we may get far smaller output when the stride is larger than one. Okay. So now the input image is five by five, and we even had one zero padding. We uh, apply one zero padding, and we apply this three by three filter corner. Then, uh, if the stride is one, then maybe uh, we will get five by five size image or six by six image. Uh, but now because stride is two, our output uh, becomes half, right? And if, if we have uh, more stride, then uh, the ratio of the image size would be more, become more smaller, right? So this is the stride parameters, okay? So stride and zero padding. Uh, this is the uh, important hyperparameters and you may uh, frequently see these hyperparameters when using the convolution operation, okay? And from now, uh, till now, we, I explained the convolution operation, right? As you see, these are composed of multiplication and addition, right? So their result, their output is differentiable respect to their uh, input, right? Okay, so they can be used as the uh, layers in the deep learning architecture, okay? Quite easy, right? And one another thing is, the convolutional layer is slightly different from the convolution 
it is, it is different from just applying the convolution operation on the image. Okay, so I will now explain the convolutional layer inside the deep learning architecture. Okay, it is based on the convolution operation, but have some more things. Okay, so let's say this is the uh, channels of the input. So I already mentioned that normally we have three channels when dealing with the color images, right? Because of because they are composed of RGB channels, right? Uh, but convolution operation had to be applied for each channel, okay? We cannot apply filter kernel uh, simultaneously to uh, these three channels, right? So this figure is denoting that, denoting each channel, right? This is the first channel, second channel, and third channel, right? And we will apply, uh, we will apply each different filter corners to obtain some intermediate output. Okay? So this is the figure that we are applying uh, to the convolutional uh, filters, which are different for each channel, right? Um, then we will get some intermediate output, okay? And next, the thing we do is we add, uh, apply the addition operation to this intermediate result, okay? And this becomes the first uh, output channel. This becomes first out channel. Okay. And the next thing is we apply another different filter corner and we'll get some different intermediate output. And by applying the addition, we will get the second channel of the output. Okay. And then uh, we will also do the same thing with different filter corners and we'll get different intermediate output channel and we will do addition to get the uh, third channel for output. Okay. We, can, uh, we can decide the channel numbers of output by our service. Okay. We can we can decide, okay. and depending on that, depending on that, the number of filter corners are decided, right? So maybe the number of filter corners required is the input channel number and output channel number. This is the number of filter corners we require, right? And also the with this height of the filter corner. So uh, this amount of parameters are required when implementing the convolutional layer, okay? So here, uh, when we obtain the nth channel of the output, we need to involve another three uh, filter corners and have to obtain the intermediate output and by applying addition, we can obtain nth output channel, okay? So anyway, we, we need uh, this amount. So this could be also changed. So be, uh, this, the, for the first convolutional layer, this might be always three because we have to apply convolution operation to RGB image, right? But for the intermediate channel, this also could be changed. So, I mean, when I is the number of channels in input image, and O denote the number of channels in output, uh, output, and we decide 
let's say width uh, W and H is the um, width and height of the filter corners, then these are the amount of uh, filter corner parameters when we implement the convolutional layer. Okay. So this is uh, so quite large. So when implementing deep uh, layers, I mean the CNNs, uh, we always say uh, deep uh, CNN architectures are consuming a lot of parameters. Uh, that's because of two facts. Because of this convolutional layer having a lot of uh, parameters for filter, right? And at the same time, we have to stack multiple convolutional layers, right? So uh, it, did, uh, it, uh, it uh, is multiplied with the number of layers, right? So because of that, we have a lot of parameters to learn. Okay. Actually, uh, I mentioned that when we apply this convolution operation, these filter corners are deciding the characteristic of the output, right? When you uh, remember this figure, right? Depending on the filter corners, the characteristic of the outputs are transformed, right? And now in convolutional operation, actually the parameters we have to learn is these filter corners, right? So in CNN, you can roughly think that uh, you are learning uh, the way how to transform the images, right? In the first part of the CNN, uh, we are, so first part of the CNN, we are applying convolutional operation to transform the images, right? And somehow we, uh, learn how to transform the images okay, at the earlier stage. And uh, in the later part, uh, we somehow reduce the 2D signal to the 1D signal to, by gradually reducing the image dimensions. And eventually, we make them as one dimensional signal, right? And we process it to transform it to proper uh, probability vector, right? So, and also I said in CNN, we automatically learn some intermediate representation, right? Uh, we, uh, in shallow learning architecture, we have to manually design the feature extractor by ourselves, right? But in CNN, we don't have to do that, but instead by learning the filter parameters, we somehow learn how to transform to the images, right? So you can say we can optimally learn how to extract features, right? From the 2D images at the earlier layers and uh, in later uh, layers of the CNN, we uh, somehow do classification. So 1D signal, transforming the 1D signal is, uh, can be similar to uh, transforming the, uh, uh, similar to what the classifiers are doing, right? So transforming the feature towards the semantic class, that's what clash buyers are doing, right? So in the later part, we can think this, uh, this is similar to clash buyers in classical uh, machine learning pipeline and the earlier stage, they are similar to a uh, feature extractor in classical pipeline, right? So this is the convolutional layer, right? So using this uh, hidden part, you can uh, obtain some um, maybe D by D dimensional and having C channel signal, you can transform it to D prime by D prime by some C prime channel signal, right? In each convolutional layers. And you can define C prime channels uh, by, um, I mean, you can easily define this C prime channel. And also you can also manipulate this D prime uh, by manipulating the try and the zero padding 
type of parameters. I don't know why. So this happens every time for 30 minutes. No, 방금 멈춘 거죠? Okay, anyway. And convolutional layer, that's the main operation, right? But uh, the other operation, uh, which is frequently used in CNNs, are uh, these pooling layers. Okay. Uh, the role of pooling is uh, reducing image dimension, 2D image dimension. So eventually in uh, CNN, we want to, uh, for the classification task, we want to reduce the image size to the 1D signal, right? So this pooling is uh, doing this kind of thing, okay? So the input image was for example, four by four, but the output is now two by two, right? And there are multiple ways to achieve this. Uh, the famous, most popular uh, things are these two, max pooling and average pooling, okay? Maybe you, some of you are already familiar with. Uh, and also there are several uh, hyperparameters in pooling. Uh, I mean, the most important is tried. The meaning of stride is similar to what uh, the convolution had, right? So we will shift the windows by two pixels when stride is two, right? And also uh, we have to define the window size as well, okay? So for example, uh, if, we, if our uh, window size is two, and if we are using stride two, then also we have four by four sized image, then we will get, uh, we will apply two by two sized window, similar to convolutions. And from this window, we will get uh, some pixels, uh, some values. Um, I mean, among these four values, we have to pick just one, okay? And then we will shift the window by two pixels because our stride is two now. And then we will also choose a one value from this four value. And then we will move the window again by two pixels and do similar thing and also by uh, shifting the windows by two pixels and we'll do the same thing, okay? So anyway, by applying this kind of operation, we can reduce the original image. That's the pooling layer. And actually, uh, there are multiple ways uh, to pick, to decide this value from these uh, remaining four values. Uh, in the original input, there are uh, multiple values, but we have to decide just one value from those values. And what max pooling does is they pick the maximum value among four values and make it as the uh, output. And here again, uh, among these four values, 30 is the largest, right? And this 30 is selected and also among these four values, uh, this one, one, two are the largest and it becomes the output. Also in these four values, 37 is the largest and they are selected. So this is the max pooling. Uh, they are called as max pooling because they are uh, selecting the maximum value among uh, four values. And Another popular way is uh, doing the average for these uh, four values, right? 
So for these four values, we apply the average operation and their average is 13. So 13 is their, becomes their output. And also here, uh, if we average these four values, it becomes eight, right? And so on, right? So these two are uh, frequently used pooling method, but uh, there are another pooling method as well, okay? Anyways, uh, the motivation for pooling is uh, they want to reduce the image dimension, right? They uh, want to gradually uh, uh, reducing the size of the image, okay? Uh, but one important thing here is the operation itself is quite easy, right? Uh, one important thing is uh, these two operations are also uh, differentiable. Uh, their output is differentiable to their input. And actually there is no parameters here. Okay? When the layer has no parameter, then uh, we do not care about, we can get this, uh, when this is output and this is parameter, and let's say this is input, then we only care about this because there is no parameters in this pooling layer, okay? So we do not have to think about this, okay? If there is no, hyper, no parameters to learn, uh, then we don't care about this dy, this data. But uh, we have to transmit some gradient signal from output to input, right? to be used for another layers in the earlier part of the deep architecture. So this have to be there, have to be defined, okay? So um, pooling is, um, these kind of operations are also seen as multiplying uh, this kind of mask to this part, right? So to select 20 among these four values, we, um, we can say uh, we are multiplying this kind of mask, right? So if we interpret like that, uh, this is also the multiplication operation. So uh, this operation is differentiable, okay? So D, we can find dy dx for this operation and they can be used in, uh, in the intermediate layers of the deep architecture. Okay. And another important layers are the activation layer. Somehow, sometimes they are called as nonlinear layer. Uh, what they does is they give nonlinearity to the uh, uh, to the deep architecture. So I will explain this again in the maybe next class, but um, I mentioned that pre in previous lecture, I mentioned that if you stack multiple layers, if you stack multiple layers, we have the possibility of having uh, modeling the nonlinearity, right? But it is not happened in uh, all cases. We on purpose have to uh, give some nonlinear operation in the middle of the deep architecture to make it uh, have the nonlinear mapping characteristic. Okay. So for that, uh, we use this activation layer. Okay. As you see, if, you, if the graphs of the X and Y, the input and output looks like this, having the straight line, this is the linear operation, right? But the operations, the functions here are not having straight line, right? Of course, this is straight line, but uh, it is not completely straight, right? So it means because of these uh, couples, uh, it is giving some nonlinearity to the entire architecture. So for that purpose, um, we are using this activation layer and I think uh, maybe next next lecture I will uh, say it again, right? I mean, if you see that, you will be clearly understanding that why we have to use nonlinear layers. Anyways, um, you can roughly think 
by using this non-straight line uh, operation, you can maybe your entire network have the non-linearity characteristic, right? So the sigmoid function and tangent hyperbolic functions, uh, they are uh, frequently used in uh, conventional CNN architectures. And their characteristic is uh, their X range is defined from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? But their Y values are bound to zero to one or minus one to plus one, right? So tangent hyperbolic, they are uh, if confined in minus one to plus one. Their y values are confined in this domain and the sigmoid, they are confined in zero to one, right? Okay. Uh, but the thing is, uh, these two operations are uh, frequently used in conventional CNN, but now nowadays we don't use them because uh, It, uh, it is because of the vanishing gradient effect, which means uh, if you stack multiple layers, right? Let's say you stack like 16 layers and you have to, uh, to obtain the, let's say Y is the final output and X is the initial input, right? You have to calculate this somehow, right? But the gradient values are usually very small, right? Usually they are uh, having the scales between zero and one, right? If you multiply very small scale values 16 times, what happens? The computer, because of the precision issue, it simply makes it to zero, right? So in practice, uh, we cannot uh, because of the precision issue. So if the values are too small, the PC will recognize it as just zero, right? So if you're uh, if your layers are becoming deeper and deeper, you have to multiply multiple layers gradient, which is less than one, multiple times. And it simply becomes zero and the training cannot be happened properly, right? That effect is called as vanishing gradient effect, right? And the gradient values of this Sigmoid and tangent hyperbolic, they are uh, their gradient has some uh, slope of this curve, right? They sometimes have, have very small scale signal, right? So uh, because of that, when you use these two types of uh, nonlinear layer, vanishing gradient effect occurs frequently, right? When the deep layers become deeper, right? But when you use this, uh, this kind of nonlinear function, of course, this is not nonlinear, right? This is not a straight line. This is not simple straight line having some curve here, right? So in that sense, this is not linear function, but uh, for positive domain, it is, their gradient is always one. And for negative X values, their gradient is always zero, right? And at least for the positive responses, there would be no vanishing gradient effect. Because uh, if the network becomes deeper, not like these previous nonlinear functions, we are just multiplying some one multiple times. Right, their scales are not becoming to zero anymore. Right, so this kind of good, uh, thanks to this good property, uh, this ReLU 
uh, can guarantee better training performance, right? So because of that, uh, this LALU was uh, frequently used nowadays, okay? And we can take this as uh, this formula. But one thing is, this LALU is not differentiable on this x, uh, x is equal to zero point, right? But we don't care for that because the computer cannot frequently represent exactly zero value, right? The, response, uh, the responses from the CNN can have very small scale uh, response in many cases, but it does not output exactly zero in many cases, right? So we are assuming that uh, this uh, point x is equal to zero cannot be reached in practice, right? So we simply ignore this extreme case and use this value function, okay? As the uh, nonlinear layer, okay? So, yeah, this is, uh, so this is the visualization for the first uh, CNN architecture whose name is Lunet, okay? But uh, this, is, this was actually uh, 90s um, proposed by Jan Mikun uh, in 1980s, okay? But uh, after this, uh, people do not use this because uh, they actually use the nonlinear function, maybe sigmoid. And uh, at that time, there is no large scale data and there was no large scale resources like GPU. So um, at this time, CNN works good for some of the application like uh, text recognition task. Uh, it, works uh, somehow, but uh, for other uh, tasks, it overfit. Maybe for the overfitting, we will learn later. Uh, it overfit, so it does not work well for uh, real world applications well. So people uh, maybe between this period, 1980s and 2012, people uh, somehow ignore the deep learning architectures. Instead, they use uh, SVN, which is the shallow learning algorithms. But uh, in year of 2012, the RLXNet appears and it uh, records the state of their performance in image classification as, uh, as this is the architecture you saw in the graph before, right? So after that, uh, anyways, this architecture have the similar architecture to this, but having some more uh, techniques to prevent the overfitting and this deep learning then uh, works good for the real world data. So people are now using more and more deep learning. Anyways, this is the uh, LUNET architecture having uh, five layers. Uh, maybe six, seven layers, anyways, uh, having a few layers. And their image size is 28 by 28. And actually at that time they use grayscale image and they apply this for image classification having 10 classes, okay? So their final output is having this dimension, okay? Okay. And this, uh, as you see here, the first early part of the CNN, uh, they are called as convolutional layers because they are composed of the mainly convolutional layers, okay? And they are processing the 2D signal. And at this moment, uh, the, uh, the output size is like this, seven by seven by 64. This is the uh, 2D dimension and this is the channel number. Right, the original channel was like this, and when applying CNN, a convolutional layer, we can manipulate their channel size, and by applying pooling, it can be reduced. 
the size 2D dimension is reduced. And also by applying CN convolutional layer, we can expand the channel size and applying cooling, we can reduce the uh, dimension, 2D dimension. And here, what they do is they flatten this uh, 2D signal. So if you multiply this, then that would be uh, this dimension, right? So, I mean, you can concatenate, you can concatenate every uh, pixel values here to, towards the 1D vector, right? Like this. So this is called as flattening, okay? So by doing the flattening, you can expand it to 1D signal and apply the, uh, the apply the multiplication of some weight and adding some bias. This is the 1D processing method and you transform it to uh, the output probability, okay? So this is the CNN architecture, okay? And actually um, the later part, semantic segmentation and this, this another type of convolution will be uh, tackled in later class. So uh, we will finish today's lecture here and maybe next, next Monday we will learn about PyTorch. So uh, using the PyTorch, uh, using this kind of concept, you have to implement some Python code now. And this PyTorch is the library that will help you to implement deep architectures easily, okay? So it is not that uh, difficult. So anyways, we will learn this from next class, okay? Thank you. See you next Monday.